Today we're going to be talking about two-body central force problems, and this is largely a chapter about astronomy, talking about the motion of the planets around the sun or about the motion of the moon around the earth. Um, so we are going to st uh, start by defining, you know, we have two objects with, uh, with positions relative to some arbitrary origin. Object one, object two, position R1 and R2. Well, in principle, this is a three-dimensional problem. I can't draw in 3D very well, so I'm just going to draw it as two-dimensional. Um, we only have uh, the force between them, so a two-body problem. This is one of the few problems that we can actually describe, the, uh, solve accurately analytically. So then we have that the force uh, on two from one is equal in magnitude opposite in direction to the force on uh, the force on object one from two. So the, we are going to then further assume that the forces are conservative and central. So, in the case of gravity, the potential, which is a function of the position of the two objects, is g m1 m2 over r1 minus the magnitude of r1 minus r2. Now, um, this is what we get for the gravitational force, but you have the exact same form for the electrostatic force. Um, so when you take the solutions we're going to get today, they're the same form for what you would get for the classical um, problem of the atom. All right, and then we can further see that because this only depends on the, the difference between the, um, the forces, that this potential is actually a function only of R1 minus R2, and really it's a function of the magnitude of that difference. Um, and we can then define that as, uh, we define the vector R in this chapter as R1 minus R2 so that we can write that our potential is really only, a depend only dependent on that vector r. All right, and a short aside, uh, the way that Taylor's book covers this, it covers it using Lagrangians. And the way that we structure our courses at the University of Tennessee Knoxville is that we skip Lagrangians for the first semester, and we cover Lagrangians in the second semester so that Really, um, there's an emphasis on um, Newtonian mechanics in the first semester, which is historically what student, we want to make sure that students who are not con necessarily continuing on to graduate school get, whereas we cover Lagrangians and Hamiltonians when we, cover the, when we get to the second semester. Because the book covers it um, with Lagrangians, I'm going to fudge a little bit. So uh, I am going to mention the way that you write the Lagrangian um, as a few asides um, and follow what the book does in this chapter. But I'm also, in a few places, I have made a deliberate effort to cover things using um, more classical Newt Newtonian dynamics and derive them in different ways as well. So this is my little aside about the Lagrangian. So the Lagrangian is T minus U, so this differs from the energy. And for this particular class of problems, this is 1M1 R1 one dot squared plus 1 half M2 r2 dot squared minus u of r, um, which, so ignore this if you're not covering Lagrangians yet. If you are, this will make great sense to you. 
All right, so then um, what we're going to do is define some more useful coordinates. Remember, a good physicist is a lazy physicist. Um, so rather than working with R, we are going to describe the position of the center of mass. Um, so we have the position of the center of mass is M1 R1 plus M2 R2 over M1 plus M2. We will define capital M as M1 plus M2. And so we get M1 R1 plus M2 R2 over M. And then we can define the momentum of the center of mass um, to be the total mass times capital R dot. And we can rewrite R1 equals capital R plus M2 over M times little r. So just to write this out, I have m1r1 plus m2r2 over m, that's this guy, plus m2r1 minus m2 r2 so here these guys cancel out and I am left with m1 r1 plus m2 r2 over m but this is just m times uh, sorry I dropped us got the incorrect subscript this is m1 r1 plus m2 r1 so this is just capital m r1 or r1 we can then write something very similar for r2 r2 is capital r minus m1 over capital m r And then we can rewrite our kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy is 1 half m1 r1 vector dot squared, where by the squared I mean r1 dot product, r1 dot dot product, product, the dot product of that with itself. Sometimes it's just really hard to say equations. It is easier to write them. 1 half m2 r2 dot squared. And now we're going to put these expressions in. And this is where it's nice to have a big long board instead of a tiny sheet of paper. 1 half m1. We're going to just put the m, the one half out in front. So this term, the derivative of that, r, bit capital R dot plus m2 over m, little r dot, quantity squared plus m2, r, capital R dot minus m1 over m r dot quantity squared and here if we do this out I get one half m1 r 
capital R dot squared plus M one M two over M. Let's see, this is an M two squared. R and then here let's see do I have too many R's this should have units of mass and ah my capital M has to be squared as well and I have to have a dot there. This is my unit check. Plus 2 M1 M2 quantity squared over capital M R big R dot little r dot. I anticipate this is going to be canceled out by the cross term there. Plus M2 capital R dot. Let me just, oh, here I need to have, here I have screwed up the cross term. It has an M2. There is not a squared there. Because I need to have units of mass for these terms. All right. M2 capital R dot squared plus M2 M1 squared over capital M squared R little r dot quantity squared units work out to mass good minus M2 M1 over capital M R dot Big R dot, little dar, R dot, and then there's a factor of two. All right. Lo and behold, this term is equal to this term. So these guys cancel out. And I am left here with ah, my favorite marker. Let's look at the R, capital R dot terms. This has an M1 plus M2. So that is equal to capital M. So I am left with one half capital M R dot, capital R scot dot squared. So this is one half times the mass of the, the total mass times the um, motion of the center of mass. And then if we look at these terms, I can write this as I've got, I've got a constant factor of M1, M2, over M, and this should have a squared on it, um, times, now if I pull that out, I am left with M2 plus M1 times little r dot quantity squared. Well, this is just capital M. Oh, and this had a squared that I forgot to keep. So this all simplifies to one half M R dot quantity squared plus one half M one M two over capital M, R dot quantity squared. And then we're going to introduce something called the reduced mass, which is M1, M2 over M1 plus M2. Um, this actually comes up a lot in physics. 
Um, and so if you have one mass that is much greater than the other, so let's take the, um, the Earth versus the Sun, let's say M1 is way, way bigger than, than M2, then this is approximately M1 times M2 divided by M1, or approximately M2, which means that you can treat the system as approximately, when you're talking about the Earth rotating around the Sun, you can treat the Sun as roughly fixed, and the Earth is rotating around it. Okay, that means that we can write this guy as one half M capital R dot squared plus one half times the reduced mass little r dot squared. So this term is from the motion of the center of mass, and this term is from the motion of the two masses within the um, within the center of mass system. Are they moving relative to each other? So we're going to write that up here um, in terms of our center of mass coordinates. One half capital M R dot squared plus one half mu little r dot squared. So that is our kinetic energy. Okay, so then I can add my brief aside about the Lagrangian. We can then write the Lagrangian, which is the kinetic energy minus the potential energy, as one half capital M R dot squared plus one half mu little r dot squared minus the potential as a function of r. And then this, because there are no external forces, so the center of mass does not itself have any potential. This is the Lagrangian of the center of mass. And this is the Lagrangian for motion relative, the motion of the two masses relative to each other. Um, so you basically can separate it into two problems and treat the motion of the center of mass as separate from the motion of the two bodies relative to each other. So then we can talk about, because we can always separate the motion of the center of mass to, from the motion of the two bodies relative to each other, um, we can look at the net force on the center of mass. So here we're thinking about, if you're talking about the Earth-Moon system, what is the force on that? And because we're treating this as an isolated system, then we get that m r double dot equals zero. Now, if you have used a Lagrangian approach, you got this equation as well. Um, but we can then we can also get this by considering um, the you know the system to be a composite object, and there are no net external forces. So the position of the center of mass, the acceleration of the center of mass is zero, and that means that r dot is a constant. That means that the um, center of mass is moving at a constant velocity, which could be zero. Um, zero is a constant velocity. Um, we then can look at the motion of the two of, of the two bodies relative to each other. Um, the, so the reduced mass, r double dot, experiences a force, which is the negative gradient of the potential, or simply the force between the two objects. So this is Newton's law for a particle with a mass mu, the 
um, which is not quite the mass we can, but it, it is the reduced mass um, and a position R. So we've taken the problem which had two bodies and we have converted it into a problem that had an equivalent problem with one body. Um, and we can choose to put the center of mass at the origin. We define co coordinate systems are arbitrary. So we can choose to make the coordinate system whatever makes our life easier because a good physicist is a lazy physicist. And um, the center of mass frame, because we just showed that the position of the center of mass is moving at a constant velocity, the center of mass frame is an inertial system. All right, then we can look at the conservation of angular momentum of the um, two particles relative to each other. So the angular momentum is R1 cross P1 plus R2 cross P2. Now, the momentum is simply M R. You cannot see that. The momentum is simply M R dot. So I'm going to use that. So I'm going to plug this in for each of these, and I get M1 R1. I do not want the dot there. Let me actually move to another line, because this is going to be a long equation. So here I have M1 R1 cross R1 dot plus M2 R2 cross R2 dot. And then I can use my definitions uh, here in this center of mass frame, R1. Let me actually change colors to highlight that this is a special case. R1 is M2 over M R, and R2 is negative M1 over capital M R. So then I can plug that in here so that I am going to eliminate my R1 and R2 and write everything in terms of R. So for this first term, I get M1 let's see I have this factor squared, M2 squared over capital M. R cross R dot plus M2. So my minus signs cancel out because I have a negative R2 and, or sorry, a negative R and a negative R dot. So I have M2, M1 squared, here I dropped my squared, over capital M squared, R cross R dot. Now these terms are of the same form. I can pull out an 
M1, M2, and I have mu, not, not mu, capital M, M1, M2 over M quantity squared times M2 plus M1 R cross R dot and this is just capital M, so one of these capital M's cancels out, and I am left with the reduced mass. So I get that the angular momentum is equal to mu r cross r dot, which is simply what we would get if we considered the angular momentum of a particle with mass mu um, and or at the origin of the center of mass. Um, so then, because we have, uh, because we are talking about central forces, um, for central forces, the, um, so the angular momentum is equal to the torque applied, or um, R cross F, and now um, the force is parallel to R, so this has the form R cross R, so this is zero, and that means that the um, angular momentum itself is simply a constant. And that means that you are then, with the angular momentum constant, um, you are fixed in a plane. So that has converted this arbitrary three-dimensional problem to a two-dimensional problem. You're fixed in the plane, which has to be perpendicular, because the cross product is per perpendicular. The r and r dot have to be perpendicular to the angular momentum. Okay, so here's where we have our little Lagrangian aside. If you, um, if you had used the Lagrangian formulation, then um, what would fall out of the Lagrangian equations is that mu r phi dot squared minus du dr is equal to mr double dot. What we're going to do is show the same thing with a, um, with a Newtonian approach. All right, so way back in chapter one, something that you probably forgot, um, I made you suffer through how we convert coordinates so we can convert, uh, we can work in polar coordinates instead of, um, instead of working in Cartesian coordinates. And I made you think about the derivatives of unit vectors. So when we did that, we said that the acceleration in polar coordinates which is r double dot is equal to little r double dot minus r phi dot squared r hat plus r phi dot or sorry r phi double dot plus 2r dot phi dot in the theta dot direction. 
that was a mouthful. Um, and this is all, so for, uh, for our case, we then have mu r double dot equals negative u, negative du dr, the, which is the gradient of the force, or sorry, the gradient of the potential. Um, and because the potential only depends on r, this is a simple term, and this is in the r hat direction. So now we can look at this formulation and compare, and we see that we get two equations, m r Let's see. mu r double dot minus r phi dot quantity squared equals negative du dr. This is from the r hat direction. And then r phi double dot plus 2r dot phi dot, and here I have a typo, this should be a phi hat, equals zero, because there is no force in the phi dot direction. I'm going to further write this as the time derivative of r see this was a theta dot hang on yes this is the time derivative of r theta dot so that when you take the time derivative of this um, you get r dot phi dot plus, sorry, I have a slight mistake here. This is r squared phi dot. The time derivative of r squared phi dot. Um, so that would give me a two r dot phi dot. This should be further mistakes. This is one over r times the derivative of r squared phi dot. And the reason I know there was a mistake is because my units were not working out correctly. So I have the one over r d dt and then two r dot phi dot plus uh, times two r r dot phi dot plus r squared phi double dot. And so this is really just saying that, ah, I did the derivative. This is just saying that this thing is a constant. And you will notice that this is just the angular momentum divided by the mass. So this, the phi direction is really just telling you the angular momentum is conserved, but we already have that. And then we can look at the r hat direction. And, ah, and I have just erased my equation. So in the r direction, we get mu r double dot minus r phi dot squared equals negative du dr. We can rearrange this. Ah, and this guy should have had a mu um, because I'm showing that I get the same thing either way. All right, so that I can rearrange this so that it looks like a force. 
and I get that M R double dot equals mu R phi dot squared minus du dr. So this term looks like um, an extra force. It actually comes from the, um, the shift from Cartesian to polar coordinates. And you can think about it as sort of quantifying that the um, quantifying that the angular momentum is conserved as well, and that lets us convert it to a one-dimensional problem. So we have now taken an arbitrary three-dimensional problem, and we really have it, so angular momentum is conserved, and that is, so the first thing is that because the, because angular momentum is conserved, you're fixed in a particular plane, wherever you start, so whatever is perpendicular, the motion must, that where you start with, r and r dot, motion is fixed into that plane. Um, and then you, you, you look at the effect of angular momentum, and it tells you further that you're actually constrained. So angular momentum gives you one constraint, and then you can treat it like a, um, like a one-dimensional problem where the constraint from angular momentum comes in like this. And then we can further look at this. Um, we will write phi dot is the angular momentum divided by mu r squared. Um, that is, so our angular momentum always goes like the mass times uh, the radius squared times the um, angular velocity, and this is the angular velocity, and here we have simply solved for the angular velocity. But we're gonna leave omega written as phi dot so that we stick with our polar coordinates because we're gonna try to solve for the trajectory of these particles. So then we can use this. So this is, in fact, a constant. Um, and that is what lets us eliminate the, um, the phi dot dependence in this equation. So we will then write this as mu r l squared over mu r, mu squared r to the fourth minus du dr. which is L squared over mu R cubed minus du dr. And this is equivalent to negative d dr of l squared over 2 mu r squared. So when you take the derivative of r to the negative 2, um, you multiply by a negative 2. That's where the negative sign comes from. That will cancel out this, and you get a 1 over r cubed. This guy comes along for the ride. And then this is just d dr of u plus negative d dr of u plus l squared over 2 mu r squared. And this, um, so this looks like a fictitious force. This is, this is the centrifugal force, so it's not a real force. It comes from the fact that you are in a rotating, uh, you're using polar coordinates, you're in a um, rotating coordinate system, you have angular momentum conserved. 
So then we can look at the behavior of this overall. So here you can see uh, for an object, for instance, a comet, this centrifugal force, uh, the effective centrifugal potential would look like this. It goes like one over R squared, so it's just a, um, it's just a hyperbola. Um, then we have gravitational, um, we have the gravitational potential energy, goes like negative one over R. So you look at the sum, and then you have, uh, with the sum, you have a slight dip in the effective energy. And uh, what you see is that the centrifugal force is repulsive, well, whereas gravity is attractive, so you get a little effective potential well. And this is going to have a lot of applications to systems, even if they're not quite 1 over r squared forces. Um, for instance, the strong force. Um, and then we can, now to move on, we want to actually work with the equation of orbit. We, we want to figure out what these orbits look like. So we are going to uh, use our effective force equation. And then um, we're going to write, we're just going to leave this. Um, so mu r double dot equals f of r plus l squared over mu r to the cubed, r cubed. And then um, we're going to do a variable change. Okay, so this is not going to seem terribly intuitive the first time you see it. That's okay. We often do this where you do a change of variables because it will simplify an equation. And keep in mind when asking yourself, so often, often when you're studying something, you want to say, well, could I have done this without the book? If I were presented with a similar problem, would I now know how to guess this? And I would say, to me, this still is an entirely non-intuitive substitution. But remember that when we're talking about motion of the planets, people had a lot of time on their hands, and they were sitting around just trying to figure this out for decades, and there were a lot of people thinking about it. They tried stuff. Eventually, something worked. So it's OK if this is not immediately intuitive. So we are going to change our variable from r to 1 over r, and then our time derivative, d dt, is going to equal, um, we're going to write it as d phi dt d d phi. So this is phi dot. And then we are further going to use angular momentum is mu r squared phi dot. So this term is phi dot, so this is phi dot d dt. So what I'm working towards is eliminating, I don't, if I'm trying to find the shape of the orbit, I don't actually care what the time dependence is. I care about having the phi dependence. So I'm going to try to convert this to a problem that depends only on phi and r instead of depending on the time explicitly. So then I can write this as, so phi dot is L over mu squared. So this, uh, sorry, L over mu r squared. So ddt, our time derivative, is L over mu r squared dd phi. Here, let me correct these. And then in terms of u, so ddt is L, 
u squared over mu d d phi. And then then I can write oh, R dot equals D D T of R and this is going to be I'm going to replace my time derivative by L u squared mu d d phi of u to the negative 1. And then this is going to be L u squared mu d u to the negative 1 du, du, d phi. So I can write this as L u squared over mu u to the negative, negative 1, u to the negative 2, du, d phi. And then these two u, u to the negative 2 and u to the 2 cancel out. And I am left with r dot equals negative l over mu du d phi. Our double dot is the time derivative acting on R dot. So this is the time derivative L u squared over mu d d phi acting on this thing L over mu d u d phi. Now L is a constant and mu is a constant so these guys can just come out in front and here I am left with negative L squared u squared over mu squared d u squared d phi squared. Now, mu r double dot equals f of r plus l squared over mu r cubed and that is equal to, so I can rewrite this as uh, going to pull out the mu, r double dot equals ah, no, I'm going to multiply through by the m, so this is equal to I multiply by, through by mu. Negative L squared U squared over mu D squared U D phi squared. So I have now succeeded in uh, making this, uh, converting this from a, uh, from Equations that depend on theta, or sorry, and phi, phi dot, r, and r dot, to depending only on r 
and phi. And relating, so this has, this has only um, r or u dependence, and this has only r and theta dependence. All right, I am going to take this big ugly mess, and I'm trying to get this, I'm always trying to get this towards something that I think that I actually might be able to solve. So, ah, so one thing that I'm going to do here is write this just as an f. I will have to write f as a function of u. And then here, this is l squared u cubed over mu. And then I'm going to take this thing, and I want to make, I want to get all of these constants out of this side. So I'm going to multiply by mu, by negative mu over L squared U squared. And when I do that, I get D squared U D phi squared. Minus mu over L squared, U squared, F equals, now here I have to worry about constants canceling out, and I am left, or, or sorry, e, this should be an equals, this thing plus U, and that has a minus sign out in front of it. And this does too. Okay, so now so far we have not done anything for a specific um, for a specific form of a function. All right, so that was a lot of math. It's good to take a breath and double check our work. So we're going to start with this equation. So far, all that we've stated. Uh, the only assumption that we have made is that the force only depends on R. And then we've converted everything to polar coordinates. We haven't made any other assumptions. So let's see if this solution makes any sense. We're going to start with the simplest possible force. Zero. This is example 8.3. So what happens if we consider when there is actually no force? And can we solve for what happens then? In that case, so yeah, so this is way more general. The only thing we assumed was that the force only depends on R. So when we have a force of zero, we should get straight motion. There's a motion in a straight line. So this solution should tell us that we have motion in a straight line. Now, that tells us that d squared u, d theta squared, equals negative u. And this should look really familiar. d squared u d, or sorry, d phi squared. I keep calling it theta. d phi squared plus u equals 0. We have always already shown that this solutions of, equations of this form have, excuse me, solutions a cosine and then omega here is 1, um, so omega phi is the, is the variable we take the derivative with respect to. Before, we've always done this for time derivatives. This constant delta is just a phase shift constant. And so this is our, so our solution is of this form. This is equal to 1 over r. This also, this means that we can write this as r equals r naught over k 
cosine of phi minus delta. And this happens to be the way that you would write a, uh, a straight line in polar coordinates. So fantastic. Now we are ready to tackle, now that we're confident in our derivation of this, um, we are ready to tackle the problem we really want to solve, which is what do orbits in a gravitational force look like? Um, so, and I just want to point out, it's a good, we're, we're, we're trying to solve these problems because this problem is itself of great significance in physics and of historical significance, but we're also trying to teach you how to solve problems. So the example is not randomly selected. It is because we want to make sure that uh, as you solve problems, you're double checking your work and you're thinking about what cases can I consider to make sure that my answer so far makes sense because at some point, when you go out into the world, you are going to solve a problem where no one knows the exact answer. So you want to take your approach and see if you get to an answer that makes sense in a case where you do know the answer. All right, now, so we are going to derive the Kepler orbits. We're going to show that they are in fact ellipses. Um, and we're going to use this equation. There's a bunch of ugly math we take the force is a, the radial force. This is so we're only dealing with forces that are radial. We're going to write it as negative gamma r squared, um, which is negative gamma u to the negative two. And we are going to denote. So this is our differential equation. Since we are only depending on phi, we're going to drop the d phi in this derivative to make it slightly less painful to write all of the equations. All right, so we get u double prime equals then this is So here we need the force. So I've got negative gamma u to the negative 2 mu over L squared u squared. Let's see. This is a positive 2, and that's a positive 2. Um, so negative gamma u squared mu L squared u squared minus u. This works out nicely because my u's cancel out here. And I get u double prime equals negative gamma mu L squared. Minus, uh, let's see, this should have a plus because I dropped the minus there. Um, and this starts to look familiar, but I have to do a substitution. So this still looks like second derivative goes like the function itself, but I have to do a substitution where dub, I will call it w, and this is uh, u minus gamma mu l squared. And then this just gives me negative w. And since this is a constant, W double prime is equal to U double prime. So my equation becomes W double prime plus W equals zero. And by now I know how to solve this. Omega is some constant cosine 
phi minus delta. So u equals a cosine just got to take a breath a cosine phi minus delta so it's w plus this thing plus gamma mu over l squared and this all equals 1 over r as a function of phi so r as a function of phi equals i'm taking the inverse of all of this um, what i'm going to do is also multiply through by l squared over mu uh, over gamma mu And I get r squared, or r of phi is l squared over gamma mu 1 plus some number cosine phi minus delta, where This I can call further C over 1 plus gamma cosine phi minus delta. So the nice part is this is the form of an ellipse, our long-awaited ellipse. Um, and then our epsilon, our epsilon is not easily determined because it's going to depend on this. And that is related to the, um, the initial conditions. Um, but epsilon is, it can vary. When epsilon is equal to zero, this becomes r of phi equals a constant. This is a circle. When epsilon is between zero and one this is an ellipse if epsilon is exactly equal to one this describes a parabola and if epsilon is greater than one this is a hyperbola okay so then you can, uh, you can actually relate the um, maximum and minimum distances for the elliptical orbits uh, to the eccentricity. R min is C over 1 plus epsilon. You can see that C gives the scale of the orbit. Um, and then uh, R min is C over 1 plus epsilon. R max is C over 1 minus epsilon. Um, and this thing, this is called the perihelion. And this is called the aphelion. And there's a whole bunch of special names when you talk about orbital motion for different parts of the orbit. It's all a lot of memorizing. Physicists are not typically big memorizers. We can then look at example 8.4 of Halley's Comet has an epsilon of 0.97. Um, and so that is a rather large eccentricity because the, for it to be an elliptical orbit, for it to be bound, it has to have an epsilon less than one. So it's barely bound. Um, and the... Uh, closest approach, R min, is between the to the sun is zero point works out to be zero point five nine astronomical units, and the um, R max 
is 35 astronomical units. So this is an extremely eccentric uh, orbit. It is just barely bound around the sun. Okay, so now we're going to take what we learned in chapter three about Kepler's second law, that the time derivative of the area swept out by, um, by one of these, by say a planet rotating about the sun, is constant, and that constant is equal to L over two mu. Um, we also are going to use that the area of an ellipse is pi times the major axis times the minor axis. And this is useful because, um, well, you can check that it's right by saying, okay, when in the case of a circle, the major minor axis and the minor axis are equal, so you end up getting pi a squared. Um, and then we can compare this to the period. So the period is going to equal the area divided by the amount of time that it sweeps out in an Per the, the area swept out per unit time. So that's how long it takes to go around a whole circle. And so now we have that our area is pi, or our period is pi times the major axis times the minor axis divided by L times 2 mu. All right, then we are going to use another relationship. Uh, we're we're going to use another couple relationships. One is that the um, minor axis divided by the major axis um, is equal to the square root of 1 minus epsilon squared. And uh, another useful constant is that this variable c is L squared over gamma mu. And then we also have the relationship that the minor axis is equal to uh, the minor axis times 1 minus epsilon squared is equal to c. <clears throat> Using this, we are going to be able to eliminate this term B so that we are left with, um, with only the major and the minor axis. So um, we're going to plug this in and we get 2 pi mu over L, and then A squared times the square root of 1 minus epsilon squared. And then we can, so this equation means that 1 minus epsilon squared is equal to C over A. And that the square root of 1 minus epsilon squared is equal to the square root of C over the square root of A. So this is 2 pi mu over L. Now I have an a squared divided by a to the 1 half, so I get an a to the 3 halves, c to the 1 half. And here I can square both sides, and when I do that, I'm going to be able to get rid of the square roots here. Now, strictly speaking, this already tells us the period is proportional to the um, semi-major axis to the three halves. That is already telling us Kepler's, um, Kepler's third law, which is that the period squared is proportional to the area to the power of three. But we're going to put it in a neater format. Period squared equals four pi mu squared
over L squared, A cubed, now we have C, and C is L squared over gamma mu. Now we can get some nice cancellations. These guys cancel, one of these cancels, and we are left with the period squared equal, oh, I dropped a squared there when I squared the pi. The period squared is equal to four pi squared a cubed mu over gamma. Now, for gravity around, for gravity, which relates the orbital um, periods of the planets around the sun. Well, for gravity in general, we have G, M, 1, M, 2. Specifically for the planets around the sun, it is G and then mu is approximately the mass of the smaller planet times the mass of the sun. Um, now you could put in G, M1, M2, and there are lots of problems you can do where you consider, for instance, the period of binary stars orbiting each other. But we're just going to consider now the um, period of planets ro rotating about the sun. A cubed, and then mu, over G mu M S. So this is four pi A cubed over G times the mass of the sun. All right, we can consider this specifically in cases of, so this is for planets around the sun. Let's leave this in and not make assumptions. You get T squared, the tau squared is equal to four pi squared A cubed. Now this is M1, M2 over m1 plus m2, and then uh, your gamma is g m1 m2, and then you get cancellation between the m1s and m2s, and you are left with the period squared is equal to 4 pi squared, the major axis cubed, divided by G M1 plus M2. And you can start with this form and say, well, if one mass is much larger than the other, well, then you just end up with the larger mass. All right, so then we can consider um, example 8.5. And here, we have the period of a low Earth satellite. So for a low Earth satellite, you have that the radius is approximately equal to the radius of the Earth. And um, you want, and then the mass in this case, the larger mass is the mass of the Earth. And you want to figure out roughly what period that has. It works out to have periods on the order of 85 minutes. Now, obviously, a low Earth satellite, it can't be sitting exactly at the Earth, but just a little bit above. Um, and so that the difference between the radius of the Earth and the radius of the um, orbit of the satellite is small. Um, so 
you, you can get slightly larger periods, but not very much. Um, and that tells you that if you want these low Earth satellites, which are often used in communication, that they have to have very fast periods around the Earth. All right, so then we want to talk about the relationship between eccentricity and energy. And first of all, we are going to take advantage of the fact that the total energy is equal to the potential effective energy. Um, because remember, we don't have quite the potential energy. We have to consider the offset from this, uh, this effective uh, potential from a centrifugal force. Um, and at this minimum position. So as whatever is orbiting gets, um, gets closer to the sun, um, at some point it reaches its, um, it basically gets, it, we're switching between energy which is all kinetic and all potential. So at some point all of the energy is potential and none of it is kinetic. And at that point when the satellite um, turns around, turns around and goes the other way. Its its kinetic energy is zero. That happens at the minimum dis the minimum distance from whatever it is orbiting. Um, so our potential energy term is then gamma over our min, and this is just from our this is from our potential, and then this is L squared over two mu r min squared, and this is from the effective potential. So um, we can then use that, um, so r min equals c over 1 plus epsilon, and uh, c is l squared over gamma mu, and then we want to eliminate our min and, uh, and only write things in terms of gamma mu, um, gamma mu L squared, and the eccentricity. So we can write that our min is equal to L squared over 1 plus epsilon divided by gamma mu. And then we can take this and we're going to pull out the, um, we're going to pull out uh, 1 over 2R min. And when we do that, this term leaves L squared over mu r min. And this term gives us a minus 2 gamma. This term does not depend at all. This is just our constants gamma. Um, for describing the force. So this one we're going to leave alone. Uh, this one we can... I'm going to box these. So 1 over 2r min is just equal to... 1 plus epsilon gamma mu over 2 L squared. And then here, this term, I have an L squared over R min. So L squared over mu r min is equal to 1 over mu. If I divide both sides here by r min um, and multiply by this stuff, I get L squared over r min. So this is 1 plus epsilon 
gamma mu or 1 plus epsilon gamma. So, here, I am left with the energy is 1 plus epsilon gamma mu over 2L squared times 1 plus epsilon gamma minus 2 gamma. And I am going to examine this term because I can simplify this. And this is gamma plus epsilon minus 2 gamma. And that is simply epsilon minus, ah, there's a gamma there. There's a gamma everywhere, so I'm going to pull the gamma out. This is gamma, 1 plus epsilon minus 2. So this is gamma epsilon minus 1. And that's nice because something that has the form 1 plus something and then 1 minus or something, then you end up getting, you end up being able to, to simplify it. So here I have gamma squared mu over 2L squared. And then I have a epsilon plus 1 and epsilon minus 1, which gives me an epsilon squared minus 1. Okay, so then because for bounded orbits, um, we have eccentricities which are between 0 and 1, the potential energy is, um, is going to be, um, if this is between no larger than 1, then this is always a negative energy. My potential energy is always negative. That's how I end up with a bounded energy. Uh, uh, sorry, my total energy is negative. That's how I ended up with a bounded orbit. If I end up with epsilon exactly equaling zero, that's a circle. Um, and that is the lowest energy that it can possibly take. If I end up with an epsilon which is greater than one, um, then the energy is positive and I have an unbounded orbit. All right, so for those unbounded orbits, um, we can consider different cases. If epsilon is exactly equal to 1, then our energy is equal to 0. And our, um, so our shape of our orbit is C over 1 plus epsilon cosine phi. And this becomes C over 1 plus cosine phi. Um, and this um, I will leave as an exercise for the student. Um, you can solve, and this tells you that y squared equals c squared minus 2cx, or you have a parabola. We can then consider the case of epsilon greater than 1. So if epsilon is greater than 1, then you have an energy which is greater than 0. And you end up with a hyperbola. So here, um, you can, again, I will leave it as an exercise for the student to show that you end up with an equation like this. Ah, it should be a y squared over beta. So there can be some offset. 
and it is, um, it is, this describes a hyperbola. All right, so then depending on your epsilon, you can have a circular orbit, uh, um, an elliptic orbit, a parabola if you have exactly zero energy, or a hyperbola if you have more energy than the, um, if you have an energy which is greater than, um, than zero. All right, so then um, we can talk about changes in orbit. For instance, if you want to have a satellite and you want to move that satellite around. All right, so here you can see a couple sketches of orbits. If you start at a, um, you start in a smaller orbit and you want to go to a larger orbit, what you can do is that you can actually fire the rocket's boost, a rocket's booster here um, when you are at, uh, at the perigee, the closest point. And then that will, because here you have zero kinetic energy. When you fire the rockets, you all of a sudden have some kinetic energy. And you will still be at the same point at the perigee, but you will end up um, increasing the eccentricity of the, uh, the rocket. You can actually do the opposite. You start in an elliptical orbit, orbit and you fire your boosters so that you slow down when you are at the perigee. And um, then you can end up on a smaller orbit, such as a circular orbit. 